All right, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, God, for bringing everyone here safely. Thank you for a place to meet in the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanseth from all sin. Lord, uh, your mercies are renewed every morning, and we need them today. We just ask, God, that you would guide the service, and may your Holy Spirit just rest upon this place and just uh, comfort the afflicted, Lord, and afflict the comforted. And uh, all this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, you know, a lot of times uh, you don't know where you are spiritually until you get tested. A big, a big thing, as you're a Christian for years, um, maybe not even for years, maybe, maybe you're newly saved and this was your account of Christians before you got saved, that they're a prideful bunch of people. So, you know, they really think they're something. You know, and when you search through the Bible and you look at what the type of Jesus, the type of people Jesus chose to, number one, be around, number two, to save, number three, to die for, the Bible says Christ came for sinners, right? So if you're not a sinner, guess what? He didn't come for you then. You know, we, we know better. We know the Bible says, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. But the fact is, before you ever came to Christ, you had to come to a point in your life where you understood how very low you were. Am I right? And, And you can't come to Christ until you understand how far from God you really are. You know, it, uh, the, it goes like this. If you, are, if you are planning on your works to justify you before a holy, righteous God, your works have to exceed that of Jesus Christ. And he walked on water last time I checked. How you doing? Uh-huh. Okay. It was, hey, let's just be honest. You know, but you as a Christian, you're not really going to know where you are until you get tested, right? And, and even, even in the school system, they understand, look, we have to put these children through tests. We got teachers in the congregation today that they'll affirm that. And you need to put those children through tests to know where they really are. Are they learning? Are they, are they uh, uh, keeping any of this information we're trying to pour into them? And God is the same way with you and me. And if once you walk through the veil of salvation, once you have trusted and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save you from your sins, you enter into what's called sonship with God, where now He's not dealing with you like the neighbor's children. He's dealing with you as His own child. All right? And uh, the problem is when people walk through that veil sometimes, they start understanding how good they got and they start opening the pages of the Bible and it starts opening up like it never has before and what happens is uh, this knowledge starts puffing them up because they're learning so much they start to get big headed and they forget where they came from and then they look back at this world of sinners, drunkenness, adulterers, all these wicked things the world's doing there oh my goodness how could you ever do that and the fact is bro you were probably worse And we need to remember that. You need to remember how low the Lord actually had to reach to get you. You know, uh, anyway. So, and the way that God tries to remind us where we came from is by turning on the heat. He comes by and He turns on the heat in your life. And He puts you through hard things. He puts you through struggles and tests and trials to watch or... Okay, I need to be careful here because God knows where you are, but a lot of what he's trying to put us through is to show us where we are. You think about uh, the funny question uh, that he asked Adam. Adam, where art thou? Why would God ask a question like that? I mean, everybody knows God knew where Adam was. How was he even there to ask him? <laughs> you know, I mean, He obviously knew where Adam was, but it was so Adam would understand where he was. Adam, he could have said it like this, and and, uh, I'm not correct in the Bible, but I'm just trying to make sense sense of these things. He could have told Adam, Adam, why are you hiding from me right now? You see? Those are the type of questions that God is asking of us as Christians. 
You know, and, uh, and the, the point is this, is that the only way God can really show you personally where you're at is by turning the heat up on your life and giving you struggles and hardships and trials. And then to put that mirror in front of you to show you how you doing, son, if you're saved. Or if you're a sinner today, if you've not been saved, he puts that mirror in front of you. How, how much longer do you think you can handle this without me? You know, and, and you start seeing the sweat pour out of, out of your you know, forehead and, and you're, you're like as if you're holding up something. It's like starting to shake. You, how, anyone ever held a piece of drywall over their head? Raise your hand. I mean, I mean, man, it's minutes, and then your arms are shaking. Am I right? And, and it's just like God is looking at you like, how long can you hold that? Wouldn't it be easier just to hand me that? I can hold that for you. But, you know, those that don't want to come to Christ, say, no, no, I got it. I got it. I, my works can hold this above my head. I'm a good person. And God's like, okay, well, I'll be here. You know, hopefully you don't wait too long. I heard a really good analogy. I want to share it. You know, for those who may not be saved in this room. Jesus Christ in the Bible is called the Son of Righteousness. Capital S-U-N. Son of Righteousness. And so we're just going to go with that Bible typology right there. See, the sun is beautiful, isn't it? The sun can bring light on a situation. The sun, I mean, without the sun, your plants don't grow. But one thing about that sun is you, teach to, you have to learn to respect the sun, don't you? At a very young age. You know, uh, you learn that if you stare at that sun too long, it hurts your eyes. You know, but if you don't respect that sun enough to turn your eyes when it's time, and you just keep glaring at that sun, it'll burn your eyeballs out, literally. And, and it will make you blind. And you know what? It's, it's, like a, it's like somebody that's continuously had the death, burial, and the resurrection put in front of them. And they keep staring at the sun, and they won't decide for Christ. They won't get saved. They will not receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And essentially, it will burn your eye sockets out, your spiritual eye sockets out. And that knocking of the Lord just gets quieter and quieter and quieter. You know, and I would ask you today, if you're not born again, today's the day. And don't, don't continuously let this thing be put in front of you and act like it's not going to affect you. I don't really need this. I came here for different reasons. I don't know what it is, but all I'm saying is Jesus Christ died for sinners. And if you're a sinner, you qualify. Amen? Amen. That gives me hope because uh, I know when Jesus Christ saved me, uh, I, I couldn't probably tell you guys half of what I was involved. You'd just walk out. That's, that's, how, that's how low I really was. And uh, some of you in here know about that, where I was. And praise the Lord, you came this morning. You know, I'm telling you, they had to jump over a real hurdle to listen to me preach, you know, with where God had to save me from. But if you're in a situation like that, don't think that the Lord Jesus Christ can't save you today. Amen? I'm, I'm a testimony to it. If He could save me, He could save anybody. But in our text, Nehemiah, Nehemiah has already received terrible news in chapter 1 uh, that has... Uh, uh, that ha shook him to the core. And essentially, it's the bad news of the situation of Jerusalem. Now, for old school Americans that are patriotic, you understand what he's talking about. For this new era of Americans that we have that really aren't patriotic, they're more, I don't know, I don't even know what you'd call them. Uh, but over and above being patriotic as being an American, you should be patriotic for the country of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I, I remember I was sharing this song with, uh, with my son the other day because I found a nugget in Revelation. You know how in our military we have the Navy, we got the Air Force, we got the Army, and they all bicker, don't they? Hold your finger there and go, go to Revelation 19. And let me show you just something interesting. It's in Revelation 19. And look at verse 14. Now, you, we're Bible believers here, right? Amen? Let's see, what, let's see what, what the Lord thinks about all that, all right? And in Revelation 19 and verse 14, it says, And the armies, plural, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. 
Now, we know that those are the armies of the Lord because Jesus Christ is coming back. This is a second advent reference. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is marching behind him. And there's no branches. It is all the army. So I, I showed Josiah that, and I said, I'm in the Lord's army. You know, and the fact is, that's why you don't sing, I'm in the Lord's navy, because uh, we know that's the church of Christ. You know, uh, we, we sing. <laughs> all right. I just had to poke fun somewhere. But, but anyway, the point is this. Nehemiah received bad news that his country, that he's very patriotic over, is in shambles. And it shook him to the core. And you see that all throughout chapter 1. Uh, pretty much the whole chapter is just his praying to God that somehow, some way, he can be a help and not add to the pain of his country that he can help build. And um, we find an interesting characteristic of Nehemiah in chapter 1 and verse 4. Right after he receives the bad news, it says, And it came to pass in chapter 1 and verse 4, Nehemiah, When I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed. You find an interesting characteristic because you go back to chapter 2, our text, you go to chapter 2, and he's the, he's the king's cupbearer. So essentially, if there's any poisonous anything coming to the king, Nehemiah had the Russian roulette job of he's the guy that has to drink it first. And so he doesn't know from day to day if he's going to live. He's, I'll try it. And the king looks at him like, how you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. It actually tastes good. Can I have another sip? And then the king's like, no, it's my drink. Give it back, you know. And so essentially, this was Nehemiah's job. And, uh, but anyway, what we see then, and we're in chapter 2 now, that the king understands, looking at Nehemiah's face, dude, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you, man? Why are you depressed? And what, what we find is that in chapter 2, is that Nehemiah actually gets scared in verse 2. It says, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? There's nothing else but sorrow. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then it says, Then I was sore afraid. We've talked about this before. The king could have executed Nehemiah for just having a bad attitude. You know, uh, you can get fired for having a bad attitude, right? I mean, that's just commonplace. Back then, the king could off with your head if you had a bad attitude. And, but the king, of us, to some extent, had a good relationship with Nehemiah. I mean, I guess after you're looking at somebody who, you know, is risking their life every day on your behalf, you start to kind of like them. You know, it would really bum me out, Nehemiah, if, if there was some poison that killed you. It would be a bad day for me, because I like you, Nehemiah. And Nehemiah's like, hey, man, well, there, there's a reason why I'm sad, and it's because my home country is in shambles. How could I hold my hold, how could I hold my peace, King? Honestly, like think about if this was your country, Mr. King. You know, how, how would you feel? And he understands. He's like, look, what's what do you need? And in verse uh, four, it says, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? Bam. So I prayed to the God of heaven. All right, this is our text. So prayer, I want to point out this. Nehemiah's prayer and his heart of prayer shows us his attitude of awareness and attentiveness. Why would he even pray about that? Think about it. Nehemiah had it made. Whatever situation his country is in, it didn't affect him. He's sitting in a, in a castle, essentially, with the king. He's probably got all the nice clothes, and yeah, he has to risk his life every day, but other than that, I mean, he's fed, he's, he's got it all. But his heart is grieved. So we're learning something about Nehemiah. We're learning something about how he got a book in the Bible named after him. You know, we're learning something about Nehemiah that God's like, you know what, over thousands of years later, he's like, look, church, look, body of Christ, I want you to hear about a man named Nehemiah. Like, what is notable about this man is he wasn't known for caring about himself. He was known for caring for others. 
You see? And risking his life to do it. Remember, I mean, he's not only going to look sad in front of the king, but now he's going to make a full-blown request of the king? What? I mean, that's a very scary place to be back then. And that took faith in and of itself. I mean, you look in the book of Esther. Nobody was supposed to walk into the king and especially make a request, bust up a meeting. And Esther's like, hey, man, if I die, I die. So she walks in there, and by God's grace, she got her request, didn't she? Nehemiah is ultimately kind of the same situation here. So we, we see that Nehemiah is a heart of prayer. He shows an attitude of awareness and attentiveness. Now, in the midst of trials and troubles, you need to focus on what you can do. Because there's things that are just out of your hands, right? I mean, you could look at the state of the union. <laughs> and there's just a lot of things that you can't fix. You can't walk into the White House. You'll sit in the gulags for 10 years, you know, without a trial. Um, you know, you can't, you can't, uh, I don't, I don't want to get too political, but, uh, you know, um, maybe your vote doesn't count as much as it used to. I'll say it like that. Um, maybe not. Well, maybe that's something that you can't do. But what can you do? Well, you could try to be a good testimony in your household. You could try to be a good Christian in your town. You know, you could try to point the people to the Lord Jesus Christ wherever you can. You could support people that are going across the seas to win a soul for Christ, missionaries. You know, there are things that you can do, okay? So for us to just sit here and just say, woe is me, I can't do nothing, well, that's not exactly right. You're going to be judged by God on something. God's going to say, look, I gave you some talent, I gave you some abilities, I gave you some feet to walk with, some hands to work with, and a mind to think with. How did you use that for me? That's what Jesus is going to tell Christians. You're going to be judged, Christian. Now, those that are not saved, you're going to get judged too on what your capabilities were. Um, there was a fellow at the track table yesterday, and uh, he was a Jewish fellow, and I told him, you know what, my mom's side of the family is Jewish. I get it, sir. And he said, you know, I just can't understand, you know, why so many Jews died in the Holocaust. And I said, well, why do you bring up the Holocaust? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, they were in slavery to Egypt for thousands of years. Why didn't you bring up Egypt? And he'd never been asked that before. And I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. Jesus came first for the Jews, just in case you're wondering. But I said, you know, you didn't bring that up. I mean, I, don't you think that was a tragedy? And he, had, he was just sitting there thinking about that. And I said, sir, we can go back in 6,000 years of human history. And we could see all the tragedies. But we're not talking about them. We're talking about you, sir. And I'm like, you're sitting there with a gospel track in your hand. What's going to be your excuse on that day? And he almost dropped the thing. He didn't drop it. But he looked at it like, he was realizing he's going to be judged for even holding that thing in his hand. It's just interesting. You know, you know, and if you think that you're going to run from God and you're going to have your series of arguments, I'm telling you, man, they're not going to stand. You have the gospel presented to you, the death, burial, and the resurrection. Amen? And if you reject that, you will be thrown into the lake of fire which burneth forever and ever. And the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Am I right? It is not God's will for anybody to go to hell. And don't let John MacArthur tell you it any different. He needs to read it again and stop rewriting it. Amen! Amen! That's good preaching, preacher! Preach it! Sometimes we got to just amen ourselves, you know? So... Nehemiah, we see something about Nehemiah, that he's others-minded. You know, prayer, because this is what we're talking about, we're talking about prayer. Prayer is most commonly noted for being lengthy, isn't it? You know, it's like, you know, people, and I wouldn't recommend it, will buy a whole book of prayers. The Catholic Church has whole books of prayers. And they're, re they're man, they're lengthy, they're long, they're flowery. 
You know, and uh, that's what prayers are normally noted for. Not normally are people commended for a short prayer other than before a good meal. Amen? Am I right? <laughs> I mean, man, you're smelling that food. You're like, oh, man, is this guy going to... Is he going to start blessing the daisies and naming all the animals on the ark? Or, or, you know, or is it just going to be, thank you, Jesus, for this food? Amen. <laughs> you know, and, but the thing is, I want to bring you a phrase of a Nehemiah prayer. And if you're not familiar with that, this is a notable prayer in the Bible of probably one of the shortest prayers in the Bible. And God commends Nehemiah for this prayer. So I just want to look at a few reasons why he would do that. So we're in our text, Nehemiah chapter 2, in verse 4, and it says, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? Bam! So I prayed unto the God of heaven. We don't know what he prayed. We don't know what he prayed. But what we do know is while he was praying, the king was sitting there like this, waiting. So I mean, did, did he... Did he lower the lights and light a candle? And, and did he walk over here? Just a moment, just a moment, Mr. King. Um, I have to get in my prayer position and lay out my rug and, and be in a closet. and all. Or was it just, I need your help, Lord. And then he makes his request. So what we can know is that it was probably so short the king probably didn't even notice what was going on. It was that short. So I want to show you a couple things. And maybe by, what I, what I do want to point out about Nehemiah's prayer is maybe by only acknowledging his short prayer, we're missing the whole picture. What do you mean? I thought it's called Nehemiah's prayer. Yeah, but there's, there, there could be something else other than just looking at this short prayer that we're missing the whole picture. And that's more what I want to look at. Maybe the, the key to Nehemiah's prayer is that Nehemiah, a characteristic of Nehemiah that we already saw in chapter 1 and 2, is he's a man of prayer. Maybe the characteristic about Nehemiah that God wants to show you today is that he never put down the phone line. Do you hear me? See, because there's a prayer Sunday. We have a prayer Sunday today. But that is just something for us to corporately pray together. But I think what we're supposed to learn about Nehemiah is he would never put down the phone line with God. That he was constantly in prayer with God. To the point where, yeah, maybe in this particular moment, he said, Lord, you better help me right now. But what we didn't see documented is this guy's been praying since chapter 1. And he probably didn't start praying in chapter 1 either, right? Maybe his mom ta taught him, you know what? Never put down that phone line, boy. Be constantly in prayer. If God would help you to bless a meal, why wouldn't he help you at work? If he would help you at work, why wouldn't he help you on the drive home? If, he, if he'd help you on the drive home, why wouldn't he help you in your marriage? Why wouldn't he help you with this, with that, with every little thing? Why would you ever put down the phone line? Am I making a good point there? All right. We know the Bible says that we're to pray always, right? So I want to look on, on uh, four things. And I want to look first is prior, his priority on prayer. Or I'll do priority with prayer. Now in our verse, it says, the king said unto me, so I prayed. Now I want to point out a couple things. Number one is that Nehemiah's prayer was habitual. It didn't just start the day the king asked him to do something. Just like when uh, Daniel broke the law, opening up his windows and praying as he did aforetime. See, Daniel didn't just start praying the day it became illegal. This was something Daniel always did. And Nehemiah didn't just start praying the day the king asked him something. It was something he always did. It was a characteristic. It was part of his fiber and being, praying to God. So his prayer was habitual. He was a constant man of prayer. But he was also committed to praying. 
Well, where are you going to get that? Well, where I'm going to get that is our verse. Then the king said unto me, Who? The ruler of his known world said something to him. And he, instead of, Sir, yes, sir, he sits there and he's like, instead of answering the king, he would rather answer to the king of kings first. You see? He had his priorities straight. And he's like, okay, God, this earthly king has asked me something, and you know what I'm about to ask him is in your will. Give me courage. And then he goes and asks him. So we know that his prayer was committed. He's committed to praying to God first. His priority was prayer. Your priority should be prayer as well. And that's why we at least try to make a time for the church to pray. Now, next, I want to show you his promptness. His promptness in prayer. Now, Nehemiah's prayer must not have taken very long. We talked about it. But can a short prayer be effective? Or is a short prayer irreverent? Think about that. That is a weight. People wonder about that. You know, I've heard people come in to this church and they said, you know, I always measure if a pastor prays more than 30 seconds. Which, okay. Okay, I get what you're saying. But are short prayers irreverent to God? Yes, sir. Yeah, but we're going to get there. <laughs> You're going ahead of me. Come on back. All right. <laughs> yeah. So what I want to show you right now, and I'll give you a few more examples than that, is short prayers are not irreverent. But what I am trying to do is I'm trying to lay that foundation that we should never hang up on God. Uh, you know, one of the things, if you ever read about Billy Sunday... His, uh, his song leader noticed one thing about Billy Sunday. Because Billy Sunday, he didn't have long sermon notes. They were literally a three-by-five card with maybe just two or three things written on a three-by-five card, and which is amazing if you study that man's ministry. Because when that guy would come into a town of, of liquor and, and dope and all this stuff, when he would leave, it was a dry town. So, I mean, I don't know, man. I'm just saying the guy had some, touch, some type of touch of God on his life. And this is what his song leader said about him. The guy that traveled this country up and down. With, this is what he said about Billy Sunday. He said, Billy Sunday was a man of prayer. He said, I, he didn't have long sermon notes, but what I understood about Billy Sunday, if you walked by the bathroom while he was shaving, he was praying. If you heard him in the car, he was praying. He was in this constant state of prayer with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was praying constantly. And look at what God did with that man. What do you think He could do with you? So let's look at a... I want to look at a few things here. Let's go to Luke 18.13. And in Luke 18.13, we meet a tax collector... And for some reason, there's a notable prayer. And it says, And the publican, that's a tax collector, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Can Just continue reading. We'll see what God thought about a short prayer like that. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. But he didn't pray some long, flowery prayer. It was an honest prayer. But what I'm trying to show you is it was a short prayer. And God looked at that and said, I like it. Uh, next, I want to look at uh, Matthew 14.30. <clears throat> you remember Peter drowning?
Matthew 14, 30. And it says, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Was that an irreverent prayer? Well, you can just keep reading. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, where, hey man, you can call me whatever you want, Jesus. Just save me. I'm about to die here. Call me whatever. Man, I know I'm little faith. Just save me. You know? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Right? But look at that just little prayer. And God's like, I like that. Look at uh, Matthew 15, 25. Now, the Syrophoenician woman in, in uh, Matthew 15, verse 25, she's a mother of a devil possessed. And what prayer do we find her praying? It says in verse 25, she's coming on behalf of her daughter. She's like, look, I got a devil possessed daughter, Jesus. I need help. I can't do it. And, and it says, then she came and worshiped him and saying, Lord, help me. Three, le three words. Lord, help me. And look at the beginning of the next verse. And he answered. Look at that. He answered her prayer. Bam. Very short prayer. So, I mean, what I'm trying to show you, and um, there's many more examples of this. In Mark 9, you see a father of the devil possess. Very short prayer. Jesus answered it. I'm trying to show you that short prayers are biblical too. Okay? I mean, it's good to have a sweet hour of prayer. Amen? But when you got to go to work and all this junk's happening, maybe you don't have an hour. Don't feel that you can't pray at all if you don't have an hour. God hears prayers that are short, too. He likes them, even. So we see some promptness. We see, that we, we see how prompt and quick Nehemiah's prayer was, and short prayers are biblical. But I, uh, I want to show you the, if we didn't catch that already, uh, the effectiveness. They're effective as well. I'll just write that here. I don't know where else to put it. They're effective. And I think I spelt that wrong. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. But they are effective. Short prayers are effective. And Nehemiah in our text, his prayer was answered. Right? Nehem wasn't Nehemiah's prayers answered? The king gave him whatever he needed. He's like, you need more? Are you good? Oh, yeah, that'll do. How much time you need? Oh, man, I'm going to need a good little while. You know, and then even the enemies, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, come up, and they're trying to turn the king against him, but the king never turned against him. Yeah. But what I want to show you thirdly is that this prayer was a personal prayer. It was short, sure, but um, it was a personal prayer. Uh, let's look at uh, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10.22, and it says, the, I, mainly I want to use, look at the first part, but it says, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with the pure water. But notice that first phrase, let us draw near with a true heart. Now, a couple things about this prayer, how it was personal, it was not a pre-written prayer. It wasn't. It was not a pre-written prayer. Now, a lot, there's a lot of money being made in the name of Christianity. And a lot of that money is these pre-written prayer books. And uh, normally folks who have like a Roman Catholic background will kind of turn to these things. 
And I'm not saying all, but there's this uh, form of like, I was raised with this, so there must be something good with it. Um, now, is there something that you could learn from a pre-written prayer of somebody in the 1500s? Maybe they, maybe they wrote this prayer. Maybe it was in some kind of prayer journal that they wrote. And you can read the prayers of John Wesley. You can read the prayers of Martin Luther. Is there something to gain from these folks? Sure. But that was their personal prayer to God. And now you can look at maybe methods that people would pray, but I would highly recommend you steer away from praying pre-written or reciting pre-written prayers. Because God wants a personal prayer. He wants to know what you have to say to Him. Um, and in uh, Matthew 6, 7, it says this. I'm in Mark. In Matthew 6, 7, it says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. This goes back to, remember, how short his prayer was. You know, with these pagan, idolatrous cultures and religions, they think they're going to be heard for their much speaking. And yet, I've given you a number of examples, and there's more. They weren't secluded to just those few I showed you. I gave you a number of examples of short prayers that God blessed and God heard and God answered and was happy with. But if there's anything to learn about prayer, and we already touched it a little, we should be preemptive in prayer. What does that mean? Beforehand. You ever heard in the military they call it a preemptive strike? What does that mean? You strike first and you strike hard. You, you know, uh, you, you, you talk to these self-defense guys, and they're like, man, if you're really going to be faced with a situation, uh, if you don't know how to fight, they would recommend strike first, strike hard, and run. Am I right? Because your odds, it, the odds are greatly in the favor of the person that strikes first. And I'm not saying that you should go around beating up people or hitting people in the face or whatever, but uh, there's just something in the human nature that is uh, uh, self-preserving. And uh, stay alive, okay? You know? But, um, but it was not a pre-written prayer, but it was a preemptive prayer. Pr it, yes, sir. Yeah, so that is uh, written to the disciples uh, that he was leading in that time. So um, when, uh, before, okay, so when, I don't want to get too far off, and it's not necessarily a Q&A right now, but um, I don't want to shut you down either. Um, but yeah, Jesus was living in an Old Testament situation. Uh, what does that mean? I thought we found this written in the New Testament. Well, the New Testament didn't technically start until the death of the testator, and you get that from Hebrews chapter 9. So you have a Jewish rabbi, Jesus Christ, who first came for the Jews, Romans 1.16, and he has a ministry of Jewish apostles that starts, he even tells these Jewish apostles, don't go into the way of the Gentiles. He tells them that. And then we see after these Jews are continuously rejecting their Jewish Messiah and their Jewish apostles that in, throughout the book of Acts you see a turning of the tide where they finally kill Stephen. And uh, I teach a threefold rejection of, of, of the Godhead. They reject God the Father when they said, give us the law, give us the Ten Commandments instead of asking for mercy. They obviously, and I don't think this can be argued, rejected Jesus when they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And then the third fold rejection of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is when Stephen was stoned in the beginning of the book of Acts. 
Um, and he says, uh, ye, ye hard-hearted and stiff-necked, ye do always resist the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Um, so there's a threefold rejection. So there's a turning. But it can't be argued that Jesus came first for the Jews. You know, so when, when you're looking at things that are technically in the Old Testament, you know, we have to rightly divide that. 2 Timothy 2.15. So let's continue. But it was a preemptive prayer. So pri- uh, this is prayer prior. And let me give you a a phrase here. Maybe it'll help. Prior prayer prevents pain. Prior prayer prevents pain. We should always be people of prayer. Amen? Don't put down that phone line. So before you answer, before you decide, before you reply, or before you explode, how about a Nehemiah prayer? God, my blood pressure's going up, God. And I'm about to burn this place down. Can you help me? (laughs) That's not a very long prayer. (laughs) But I I bet it'll help. It might not completely extinguish the whole situation, but I bet you'd act a lot better after saying at least that. Amen? (laughs) You know, um, so it was a personal prayer. That's what I wanted you to know. And we're trying to move here. Um... Number four, uh, it's the putting on of prayer. Uh, It's the putting on of prayer. Uh, Let's go to Ephesians 6. And I want to read to you some verses. I hope you won't be mad if I read a little Bible today. Yeah, good. That's why I like you guys. We're in Ephesians 6. Let's start in verse 10. You're familiar with these verses. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Normally, they close it off right there. What is the, uh, what, what's at the end of that sentence there? You see, what is the punctua- punctuation at the end of verse 17? It's not a period? That means it's continuing. Look at verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication, which is prayer again, for all saints. It continues even there. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. It continues to verse 20, for which I am, also, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But look, prayer is as much as a part of the spiritual armor of God as any of it. Prayer. Well, Randy, I can't sit in the closet all day, man. I can't do 40 hours a week in the prayer closet. Amen. Pray when you're on the job. Pray when you're hitting your finger, you know, with the hammer. Amen. Pray. You know, uh, pray when your car breaks down. Pray, pray when it's running good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, if your cars are anything like mine, they're running on a wing and a prayer. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But... The putting on a prayer. Because you need to understand that we are in a warfare. You know, there are arrows and bullets flying all around this room right now. You know, oh, Randy didn't dress very nice today. Oh, look, he has a hair out of place. Look, man, he trimmed his beard off all weird. Look at that freak, man. You're going to listen to him? You know, or man, it's hot in here. You know, and the devil's like, isn't it hot in here? You know, how, how can you sit here and listen to this? Aren't you sleepy? Aren't you tired? Didn't you? You worked hard. Come on, you deserve a little rest, don't you? 
you know, and all these things are happening in this room. You are in a warfare. And the devil doesn't want you to keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, or keep your Bible open. Amen? He doesn't want any of that. Why? Because your effectiveness with the Lord God will probably... be somehow acquainted with your involvement in this thing that's called prayer. How effective are you? Maybe we could measure your prayer time and say, are you going to be at all? I mean, the whole point is it doesn't have to be a long prayer. That's the whole point. But do you have any prayer? Do you pray at all? Isn't there anything to pray about? Don't you have any sick family members? Man, they need prayer. Don't we got any sick church people? They need your prayers. You know, I mean, isn't there anything in your life that you could possibly bring before the throne of grace and make a petition? God, I need your help. Bring it to Him in prayer. You know, uh, Charles Spurgeon, he had a really interesting idea. He's a very smart man. Um, he had an interesting idea. He said, what if you made a commitment today that any time you heard somebody cuss around you, you would just pray? He said, don't you think the cussing around you would probably stop because the devil knows that you've made a commitment any time you hear cussing that you're going to start praying? I mean, what if it wasn't that? Maybe it was like any time I walk by or can even smell a cigarette, I'm going to start praying. Or I, the new thing right now ain't cigarettes, is it? It's like any time I'm in a Walmart parking lot and the whole parking lot smells like marijuana, I'm going to pray. Amen. I mean, wouldn't that be something if you start not smelling marijuana all the time because the devil knows any time that you smell marijuana, you're going to pray? I mean, the point is, what if, what if you did that with cussing? What if you did that any time somebody asked you a question and you just took a moment and you're like, God, can you help me? You know, what about when you're driving? What about this? Anytime you see a road rager or somebody speeding or somebody uh, cutting you off, that you're like, God, anytime someone cuts me off, I'm going to start praying. And that devil's like, he's going to have that guy coming up and he's going to realize, wait, he made that commitment to who? To God? No one will cut you off anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. But wouldn't that be interesting? You know, it's a good thing to make a commitment to praying before you eat. That's a good reminder, isn't it? I bet you will pray regularly if you commit to pray before you eat. Because I know you eat. <laughs> right? You know, uh, Pastor Yancey, he used to even pray over his coffee, man. I'm like, man, I like coffee. You know? <laughs> but uh, what about spiritual attacks? What about would you commit to pray? Would you commit to pray? Well, it's too late. Just drop your knees, man, on the floor but I'm tired. You're just going to sit there and get kicked while you're on the ground? Drop to your knees. Pray. So this prayer life, this Nehemiah prayer, it was a decision. You have to put on prayer. It's going to be against your flesh probably when it comes up too. Uh, you think about the pressure that Nehemiah had as he's sitting in the, in the king's corridors, you know, with all the gold and silver hanging and probably all the audience sitting watching the king, you know, so, I mean, really, like, he's arrayed in all his glory and all his honor, and he calls out to who? Nehemiah, of all people! And Nehemiah's like, just a moment. I'm going to go to the king of kings first. Don't you think that went against his flesh to pray? Of course it did! He made a decision. I'm going to pray. Now, uh, lastly... That was lastly. Good. Let me give you a quote from an evangelist, Terence Calvin. Uh, he, 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 he actually got saved out of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. And now uh, his dad is still a missionary preacher there. And uh, he's a traveling evangelist. He, maybe he'll come here one day. But he, he, he gave a notable quote about prayer. And, and I, this is just something to chew on as we go into our prayer portion of the service. General prayers don't generally get answered. How about that? 
General prayers don't generally get answered. All right, let's, um, let's go ahead and we're going to shift gears here. And um, so the guy.